aquesta que és una mica l'anatomia. I am very happy to introduce, a pro to introduce Professor Osama from Cairo University. He's a very, very good friend of me. He is now a faculty in a course that we are doing downstairs about surgery. And uh, I know his uh, excellent presentation about uh, history of the anatomy. And I suggest him if he could present for the first day of the class here with the students. And of course, he told me, he told me yes, of course, and he's a nice person. And I think it would be interesting for you here this uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, do you all speak English well? Yes. Yeah. 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 well? OK. This question, this question is because if they say no, you can speak Spanish. You can speak Arabic. Most First, I'd like to thank you, Chevy, for giving me this opportunity. History is my passion. Actually, besides my working as a foot and dance surgeon, I am a professor uh, of orthopedics in my uh, university, and I'm a tour guide. I organize tours for tourists in Egypt in the historical places. I have three books in history published in Egypt. So this is my passion beside my work with Chavi in Foot and I, I know so. because I visited uh, several times Egypt and he personally showed me Cairo, no? the old streets of Cairo, no? and he's a very, very deep uh, knowledge about the history of Egypt, of the streets, so. Many histories about the streets of Cairo. I know that this is an okay. Recently, I started this project in my university to teach our students the history of medicine as a whole. And I tried in each beginning, in each semester, to give uh, some lectures about history of anatomy, history of surgery, history of medicine, and so on. Uh, and I'm going to publish this as a book. Here, because we are in the anatomy department, I will give you the story of anatomy, knowing our body, starting from the early beginning until now, okay? So, I like to ask you first, is it important to learn history? Why? Why is it important? You said yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, because if you learn history, uh, okay, uh, you can know more about your well, about the culture, and you can understand better, well, the time you are living. Yeah, I agree with you. Yes, sure. When we know history, at first it's amusing, it's entertaining to listen to a story, yeah? And it's educational, as you say. We can understand the past by reading history, so we can justify our present. Now, when we know how things start, we can understand how could we reach to this point. And finally, you can have insights for the future, even so you can change your mind. As surgeons, I can <coughs> tell you, we now return back to some procedures which were done maybe 100 years ago. So always learning history gives you insights to the future. Well, in this lecture, it's a long one, you will have History of anatomy in prehistoric period, ancient Egyptians, Greek period, Roman period, Christianity and the early Islamic civilization, in the Middle Ages, Renaissance period, in 20th, 12th century, and finally, the new technologies <coughs> in teaching anatomy, included your anatomy at the whole time. It's a long one. Okay? Are you ready? Okay. We can say that the early beginning of learning our anatomy was just by observation. I don't know who was the first creature, maybe Adam, maybe one, someone else, okay? But I can expect he started to learn his body by just observation. Do you read the Bible? Sometimes, <laughs> okay. If you read in the Bible with some sentences about the first creature, Adam, and the eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. This is in Genesis in the Bible. Similar for Muslims or for non-Muslims in other textbooks. When they ate from the apple, they started to recognize their body. So the word realize and the word apparent means the first knowing of our body was just by observation. 
They can see the haplex, they use the forking hands to use it, genitalia to reproduce, and they have internal, uh, uh, some structural steel apparent for them. So this is the first <coughs> way of knowing. After that, the human beings start to gather in graves and tribes. And in the prehistoric times, we found the early prehistoric man, and we have some drawings in the caves showing that they were living in groups and in families. In this time, we don't know exactly how medicine was practiced, but we can find some clues that diseases at that time were thought to be due to supernatural causes, forces, magic, something like that. And in these tribes, there was always a man, this man called the shaman or saman, and this was called the shamanism practice of medicine. Shamanism means the person who knows. He is a magician. He knows and he thought that diseases occur due to supernatural powers and forces and he makes some magic tricks to cure patients. But the first document, if I ask you what is the first document of medicine on earth, we will <coughs> document now. It is what we call the Edwin Smith Papyrus. It's an ancient papyrus dated to 1060 BC, and it's named Edwin Smith because he's a scholar from the United States, came to Egypt in 1862. He visited Luxor, Luxor is a historical city with temples in Egypt, and he bought a papyrus. You know the papyrus? It's just a piece of paper like that. And he found this papyrus, it's about one meter and three meter long, and he rolled it up, he doesn't understand what is the language written inside, it's ancient Egyptian language, and he left it at his home. After 50 years, his daughter was interested in Egyptology, and she was also a physician. I don't know what's the relation between physicians and dogged history, maybe some connections. And she started to make investigation with one of her colleagues about what's inside this papyrus. Surprisingly, she found that it was a surgical papyrus describing 48 cases of diseases and trauma. And these diseases are indexed from the head to the toes down and from superficial to deep. And the cases have many, many different scenarios. One of them was head trauma. It was the first document describing if you had head trauma, you may paralyze your feet. And it was written in this papyrus at that time. Another papyrus was found in the <coughs> same time. It was called the Apres papyrus, which contains description of many medicines and uh, uh, syrups and herbs which are used in curing diseases. So if I ask you what are the first documents in history for medicine, these two documents, Abraham's Papyrus and Edwin Smith's Papyrus. Who wrote this? Which one in Egypt? Who is the person responsible for writing this? Exactly, we believe strongly, and a lot of evidence in history, that these two Papyrus were written by Imhotep, philosopher, astronomer, architect, and he was a prime minister in ancient Egypt at the time of 2006. His name Imhotep <coughs> is very strange. It means the one who came in peace, in peace. This man was the prime minister at the time of King Dosa, and this man is known in our Egyptian history by building the earliest version of pyramids I think you visited that once, Kavi. It is a stepped pyramid. It's different from the normal pyramids we know. This man was also a physician. He's a very, very talented physician. He could make and write these two papyri, and they were written and spread later on. Okay, let's back to anatomy, story of anatomy. Why the Egyptians were interested to anatomy? Anybody knows? Why? Yeah, excellent. Bravo. Yes, it's for embalming. Embalming is mummification of children. It's preserving the bodies of the dead bodies. Embalming was done in a very sophisticated way that indicates 
that these people were very clever in anatomy. You imagine they were removing the internal organs, the stomachs, the heart. They can take the brain out of the nose. Transesphenoidal approach in the ENT, they do it. They suck the brain and put it in jars to keep it. This process was done in a very holy and sacred way because they believe all these segments and pieces will collect again in the afterlife and the man will take his organs with him. So they were doing it very sophisticated. And the, this process was done by priests, not with physicians. What is the problem of that? If priests do that, is this a big problem? Yes, it's a big problem. It remained a sacred science, sacred science. Nobody knows it. Physicians don't know it. So priests didn't transfer their knowledge of anatomy, and it remained a secret, like many secrets of ancient Egyptians. We don't know how they could build the pyramids. <coughs> we don't know how they could build these high, high temples. We don't know how they did mummification until now. So Egyptians died with their secrets. We don't know the secrets they have done before. And we have some articles saying that, that Egyptians didn't transfer their knowledge and the Egyptian secrets has gone and came the next empire in the world, the Greek, okay? The Greek started with Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great established it in Macedonia and they started to make a very big empire extending to Persia and India. Alexander was a young man, 32 years old, when he had ruled about one third of the world. Alexander the Great, okay? During the Alexander time, the Greek start their civilization. Unlike the Egyptians, the Greek were passionate with the human body. If you visit Rome, how many of you visited Rome or Athens? Yeah, you will see, the, how many of you visited also Egypt? Oh, great. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, there is big difference between Egyptian, Egyptian statues and the Greek statues. While the Greek statues are animated, too much details about the body, there is nudity, they don't afraid from nudity. You will find the Egyptian statues like that very conservative, okay, very straight. Women are dressed, no new statues, okay? This is since ancient Egyptians. So with this new look for the human body, we find a passionate look of a human body in the Greek culture. And then came this great man. Who knows this man? Hippocrates, the father of medicine. Hippocrates, started the philosophy of the Greek about human body and everything. Hippocrates had a lot of things. In our country, for example, I cannot practice medicine unless I say the Hippocratic oath, you know? You do the same, I think. I swear that I preserve the dignity <coughs> and dignity of my patients and I respect my teachers. You do that, okay? The same, still, he put the disciplines and he put everything about the ethics of practice since this ancient time. Hippocrates also was the first to say diseases are not due to super forces. Diseases are due to natural causes, okay? Also, Hippocrates put a theory of physiology which remained for 1,000 years. This theory called the four humor theory. He said that the body is formed of four fluids, and the mix of this fluid is responsible for our uh, diseases and our health. Remain for a long, long time. This theory, to be proved, it must have some anatomical proofs. Who could make these anatomical proofs? One more philosopher in the Greek period. He is very, very clever man and famous. His name is Aristotle. Aristotle was a philosopher also. He was the first to study anatomy in experimental way. At that time, it was not allowed to dissect the human body, but you are allowed to dissect animals. So he started the comparative anatomy. He studied animals. He was the teacher of Alexander. 
He dissected lions, donkeys, monkeys, everything on earth he study and he make notes and he writes some conclusion. He could discover a lot about the uh, uh, major circulation systems, the heart and vessels, and he wrote a conclusion. One of them was wrong, which is the heart is the center of emotions. <coughs> Do you believe in that? Women believe that, but men don't believe that. <laughs> okay. So Aristotle put his studies and he made the first comparative study about them. After the end of Alexander, he died. Alexander, his huge kingdom, he had no children. We all wonder that he had no children, Alexander. He died early in his life. So his huge kingdom was divided for his colleagues and mates. One of his colleagues was very strong, he is Patlemy number one. Patlemy number one, he was uh, a leader, a war man, and he was a thinker, he was a scientist, and he was believing in science, and believing also in Alexandria in Egypt, the capital of Egypt at that time. He made Alexandria the capital, and he allowed to build there a huge building called the House of Muses, which has a lot of museums inside. And he allowed for the first time in history the dissection of human body. Who was dissected? Who? Not dead bodies, but captives, criminals who were sentenced for execution. Instead of execution, they were used for experiments and for dissection life. This happened in the house of Muses. Besides that, he did a lot of things at that time. To gather all knowledge in the world, to visit under a single roof, he collected manuscripts from everywhere, from India, from Parsia, from everywhere. And he made a library which contains more than one million scripts, including the translation of the first translation of the Python into Greek language. Okay. One of the things which he built was the Alexandria School of Anatomy. And it was the first place who, which teaches anatomy <coughs> for students and who wants to learn the anatomy. This was built in 3000 BC. One of the most important teachers in this is Herifoli, Herifoli of Alexandria. Do you know any, did you study the new anatomy? Have you studied new, it's your first day? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, this man is considered the father of neuroanatomy. He dissected 600 prisoners, prisoners, okay? And he made extensive work in the nervous system. He could differentiate between sensory and motor nerves and discovered a lot of cranial nerves. And also, he was the first academic teacher who described in sophisticated way the circulation of the brain. And when you study your anatomy, you will find a name here is called the circular trochlea of herophily. It is named after this man who was in 300 BC. It's an anatomical site named after him, Antina. And if you go to literature, you will find a lot of paper describing the rule of this uh, medical school and the people who work it inside it. The Greek Empire finished, the Patlemic Empire finished, and started the Roman with Augustine, or Octavius, after he killed Antonio, and Cleopatra suicided. You know the story, the famous story. And Augustus established the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire shifted the interest of the world from Alexandria to Rome, the new capital. So Alexandria didn't influence anymore during the early Roman Empire. Until came this man, Hadrian. Hadrian, I love this emperor. I traced his monuments in seven countries. And each country I go, I make pictures with his statues. This man, yeah, 
this man is the greatest Roman Empire in my mind, and he has bad story. I wrote a book about his story before. You can find it in my first book page, some hints on this story. And one of the things he made, he revived again the rule of Alexandria and built the Senate Academy again, and he asked scientists to return back to Alexandria. One of the scientists who came at that time was Galenos. I think Chavi knows Galenos very well. Because Galenos was the father of anatomy, modern anatomy, for a long, long time. He spoke about dissection and his book about the anatomical procedure existed for more than 1,000 years as a main textbook and the main reference. You will read in all textbooks, Galenos, Galenos, Galenos. He was through work at that time and he came in the time of Hadrian. Alexandria <coughs> finished at, you know, at the time of Constantinus when the uh, Roman Empire shifted into Christianity at that time, and the Roman kingdom, the religion, the official religion at that time was Christianity. At that time in Alexandria, Christianity entered early, and these people were considered non-believers, and a lot of chaos and revolutions happened at that time, and there were a big chaos and revolution which resulted in the birth of Alexandria Bibliotheque and Alexandria Library. And the last scientist who was the chief of Alexandria, Hypatia. Hypatia was killed during this revolution. And you can see a movie of Hypatia on YouTube. It's very, very sad story about this great scientist and how she ended his life at that time. And you, there are uh, also a novel written by uh, uh, an Italian uh, writer about Hypatia, okay? After that, <coughs> we started a new era, which is early Christianity, which lasted for many, many thousand years. In Christianity, we can say, in Christianity and the early Islamic dynasties, this war is a centuries of inhibition. At that time, there was great respect of the human body. Dissection is not legalized and not allowed to dissect the human body. You can read in the Bible, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. The same words and statements you can find in Muslims. So the look of Muslims and Christians for the human body, this is not for dissection. We have to bury it, we have to respect it. We have to, so it was completely different. Okay. So we say, depending on the old textbooks written in the Greek period, during the whole early Christianity and early Islam, only two books of Galenos and the theory of Hippocrates were the two theories available for more than 1,000 years. Until the 10th century, when the new civilization of Arab started, and there is a famous scientist called Avicenna, Avicenna or Ibn Sina, and in the same time in 10th century, I think there was Andalusia, something here in Spain, the same. <coughs> At that time, there was a lot of translations of the Greek work, and these people started to do their own work. One of them, Avicenna, who made the Encyclopedia of Medicine, which was named the Canon of Medicine, and another one called the Book of Healing, which remained as a textbook until the Renaissance period and for a long, long time. Another scientist came in the 12th century in Egypt. His name is Ibn Nafis. This man also made a lot of comprehensive studies on microcirculation. He was the first to say, that venous blood must meet to arterial blood somewhere, and he suggested that to happen in the lung. So he wrote the first pulmonary circulation drawing. You can see it here, it's a very early drawing, and he was using his dissection. If you visit Egypt, I will take you to, to the place he used to 
make the section of the human body at that time. But he was using the section for dead bodies only because it was a chief of hospital. When the body dies, before he bury it, he make his work and his lap and then bury him. Okay. Until came this legendary man, Da Vinci. Who doesn't know Da Vinci? Da Vinci. You know, what do you know about Da Vinci? What's his famous work? Betrayed your man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What else? Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah. And what else? Uh, a bridge uh, in order to the work. Okay. The, uh, you can reach the bridge and do this. You don't have to be. Okay. Yeah. Well, so yeah. if you. Bit, what? Okay. When you go to Rome, you have to visit. Yeah, guys? Okay. I know you all like Da Vinci. And <laughs> when you visit Rome, you have to go to the Vinci Museum. In the Vinci Museum, you will find this is really, really a brilliant, extraordinary person. He was inventor. He made in his drawing some inventions like helicopters, like uh, 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 diving suits, like many, many things, which is incredible. Uh, early cannons, early weapons, early things. And in other way, he was very famous of his extraordinary talent in painting. So we remember Paul, Mona Lisa, and the last dinner of Da Vinci, and many, many drawings by Da Vinci. Da Vinci was this is in the museum also of Da Vinci. <laughs> and he had good connection with the emperor at that time. The Italian emperor allowed him to start the section of human body. You know, before that time, still the church was very strong and they prevent the section. But Da Vinci was accepted, exception, because he was allowed by the emperor to dissect certain human bodies. And he asked him to make a new book of anatomy. Da Vinci made wonderful drawings. This is very famous. If you go to the Google, you will find extraordinary drawing of anatomy. 750 pieces of anatomy. And it was incredible in its details, and which is still right now. We don't know how he could make this section. This is the one you love. This is Vitribian man. Vitribius man is the body proportions. He could study the human body proportions, the span, the height, the body is divided into four equal cubes, and we have a golden ratio between each part, 1.6 to 1, 1.6 to 1, 1.6 to 1. It's repeated everywhere in our body, and this is was, I don't know how he could know that, but this is true. Until now, his study in proportions are main reference for the schools of artists who want to know how to draw, they have to study what Da Vinci made in the 16th century. Well, following Da Vinci, another guy called Vesalius. We call him in history the Gallaus Polar. You know what is Gallaus? Gallaus. Gallaus. When we hang people sentenced for this, he hangs them with ropes, okay? This is called the Galau. He was following the Galau. Once he knows that there's some dead body, fresh dead body, he goes quickly and he starts his work, lab work, and he makes the sections. And he wrote a nice book, which is the main reference of medicine, known as the Dehumani Corporis Fabrica. I think this is Italian, not Spanish. That means the structure of the human body. Ended the 6th century and came the 17th century with legalization of the section when there was a lot of demands to dissect, to make a new Renaissance period and to make new science. At that time, it was nice that the Royal College of Physicians in London made its declaration to allow people to make this section, this section of the human body for certified persons, not anybody 
Some people are allowed to make this section of the human body. And the court in France and the Maryland made the same. They allowed the section for the human body. And the anatomy lesson at that time was a big ceremony. If you go to Amsterdam, you have to visit Rembrandt's house. And in Rembrandt's house, you will find these nice anatomy uh, 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 paint uh, called the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tolp. They invite the students. The students sit in front of the professor. The professor <laughs> starts to write. And they ask one of the great painters at that time to make a draw or a paint for the lesson as a documentation. And this is one of the earliest documentation of anatomy lessons in 1632. A lot of students want to study anatomy, the new science, and the new exciting uh, uh, branch of medicine that they, oh, okay, we see a lot of things, and people are enthusiastic to that. So they needed more and more students. There is not enough space. So they started to create the anatomical theaters, and this was the first anatomical theater in Missile Land in 1616, and it still exists until now. I don't know, I am a little bit older than you, <laughs> just three or four years, but I had uh, in my anatomy department, it was in the same design. I think you may have one of the rooms in the same design. This was the old design that this body is put here, and students sit around and the doctor start the same <coughs> No cameras, no videos, no audiovisual, okay? In modern Egypt, at that time, we revived again. At that time, Egyptians were starting a new civilization with one of the uh, kings, Muhammad Ali, after uh, the French campaign came to Egypt. One of the physicians from France, Anthony, uh, Claude, he asked the uh, minister uh, at that time that he wants to make a school of medicine. And he made the first modern school of medicine in Egypt at that time. At that time, you have the church in Europe and we have the mosque in Israel. And the biggest mosque in the Islamic world was Al Azhar Mosque, it's an Egyptian mosque here, which is a leader, it's like Vatican for the Christian world, okay? At that time, there was an influence for the, uh, uh, the Muslim priest or the man, it's like the Pope. When he say no, it's no. When he say yes, it's yes. Everybody will follow. So the students at that time, they were not happy with the idea to dissect the human body. But at that time, the Imam of the mosque, Al-Azhar, came, this was his name, Muhammad Hassan, and he told, okay, it's important for Egyptians to learn anatomy. And he realized at that time this section of human beings, and they started the first lesson exactly like uh, Rembrandt, and they painted the first lesson of anatomy in Egypt in 1829. After that, no more this sentence. People are not executed anymore. We don't have bodies. We have a lot of students. How can we solve this problem? We need more bodies for the section. So started the ideas, why not to preserve this body <coughs> so I can make a lot of lessons on this body. It's not single use body, I can preserve it. And they started again the process of embalming or preservation of the human body. Okay? You know, Egyptians were the first to preserve the bodies with salt. They put nitrous salt and for mummification. And then formaldehyde came in 1869. Then came another modified method, formaldehyde also. And recently, they say, we have to return back to salt for preservation for better quality of tissues during this section. Freezing of the cadavers, we have here fresh frozen cadavers, which are used was discovered accidentally in Germany. At one night, there were a morgue man called Wilhelm Kramer in 1870. He was sitting in Leipzig when a dead pregnant woman came to him for giving him a morgue and tomorrow she will 
the uh, funeral or something like that. He, it was very cool, I see, and he forget about the body of the lady, and he went for a vacation. After one week, he returned back, and he found the body is frozen. And he started to work in this frozen body, and he could describe a method of freezing of dead bodies to preserve it. And also he described what we call it the sectional anatomy. He cut the body into different pieces uh, to make sectional anatomy. And this was the first attempt in 1870. After that, fresh frozen calibers were used in different labs. And now in the down upstairs lab, you will see the fresh frozen calibers. And it's uses in biomechanical studies, in surgical studies, and all of that. With the need of a lot of fresh frozen calibers, <coughs> you, for example, in the court we are doing these days, we consume how many pieces? 24. 24 pieces, okay? So we have a lot of demand of fresh calibers. And the only way, there is no trading for that, suppose there is no trading, the only way is donation. When people die, they donate their bodies. And so in England, they made a declaration or act to regulate this process and how can people donate that? Because if it enters in commercial side, it will be a problem. And although there is a lot of widespread of cadaveric labs, more than 200, we have some here, we have here in Barcelona also, this cadaver lab downstairs. Still, fresh cadaver trading is a concern. And I got an article from Reuters newspaper talking about the commerce. In the uh, United States is the most important market which deliver the fresh frozen calibers to all over the world. And they wrote about the companies which deliver that. And they were surprised the number of pieces and specimens were, are done like that. And they are very expensive. So now it's a concern. Is it a still donation or it's a commerce? So Reuters reached a conclusion in Americans need the bodies for science. They also donating for commerce because a lot of sector of companies are working in this. So we had a new movement came again called the anti-dissection modernists. And we returned back for many, many hundreds of years again. And the same questions. Should be the section of human being until now be legalized or we should stop that? And they built a lot of defense for this theory. Now you have these anatomies and electronic media and simulators which you can shift the dissection of human body. In conclusion, since ancient Egyptians until now there is continuous debate about the humanity anatomy and the section of human body. Alexandria School of Medicine was the first anatomy school on Earth in 600 years. And the practice of anatomy <coughs> section in late Greeks and the early Romans was outstanding by Herophilus and Gallicos. Avicenna and Abdinafis translated a lot of words and they could make uh, nice translation and studies on animals. Legalization of anatomy happened in the 17th century Modern and multimedia can replace the classic ways of anatomy. Thank you very much for your. Uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoy. And if you need any question, I'm ready. Okay. What? Well, thank you, Tanya. <laughs>